you very much, Mohammed. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be back here in this same lecture theater almost exactly two years. Last time I was here was, I think, 22nd November 2013, and uh, this uh, rather remarkably coincided with negotiations in Geneva at the time, which led to the joint plan for the joint plan of action between Iran and the group of uh, P5 plus one. Uh, the subject was Iran sanctions and the ongoing negotiations uh, were very much relevant at the time and as Mohammed said, uh, we stand at a particular conjuncture where although it's too early to judge the outcome of the comprehensive agreement reached in July, but at least, uh, and I'm very pleased to uh, stress this, I think uh, the best thing out of this uh, agreement is that at least it uh, helped us avoid or avert another catastrophic war, potentially, that is. So uh, with that positive note, I hope uh, next time I'm here, sooner than two years, we'll have also better, more positive developments on the Arab uprisings and the outcome. Um, in choosing the question for tonight, I wanted to take a deep look back at uh, my own profession, economists, and uh, ask them, where were we? Did we actually offer some insight before the spate of Arab uprising? And do forgive me if I'm not going to be using the term Arab Spring, I'm sure you'll understand. The spate of Arab uprisings which started in uh, 2010 with Tunisia and then uh, a number of other countries. And of course you will remember how much optimism uh, there was at the beginning. And, and that unfortunately has dissipated uh, rather quickly. Economists and forecasting economic or financial crisis do not go very well together. I mean, you remember the global financial crisis in 2008-9 was missed by almost all economists. Of course, after the event, there were a few lone voices who claimed they had uh, predicted it all. And some had warned about the imminent crisis, except that those warnings had fallen on deaf ears. So I'm conscious of the fact that talking about predicting major outcomes Certainly, when it comes to predicting, forecasting an economic or financial crisis, economists don't seem to have a very good record. We are very good at trying to explain it after it's all happened and rushing forward to uh, offer solutions for the crisis, some of which are our own making. When it comes to actually explaining social and political upheavals, admittedly, this is even more difficult. And you could even uh, argue that it's not a fair question to put to economists. This is the job of political scientists, other social scientists. Uh, why should economists be able to predict? Well, I want to uh, beg to differ because I think uh, economists are concerned with issues which uh, relate to political uprisings and social upheavals. We do talk about welfare, we do talk about standard living, we do talk about equity, uh, and so on and so forth. And moreover, moreover, economists also go further and by examining the economic fundamentals or macroeconomic performance sometimes uh, give a rather rosy picture of the situation. And the Arab uprising, the performance of some Arab countries before the uprisings was not an exception. The World Bank, for instance, the IMF, were very content about the economic performance of Egypt or Tunisia, particularly those countries which had embarked on uh, neoliberal policies of adjustment and market-friendly growth. They looked at macroeconomic fundamentals and they concluded that since the right policies have been adopted, they are on the right track. There is no evidence, there is no sense of initial stress. So the Arab uprisings did come as a big surprise. I have been to conferences where people from international institutional 
uh, from international development agencies have actually put it stark in terms of what went wrong. You know, why couldn't, you know, there's a little bit of soul searching and the World Bank admits in its publications now that uh, uh, economic indicators fail to predict the Arab uprisings. So this, in a way, raises the question whether the choice of those indicators was limiting, whether we were looking at the wrong things, and therefore they were giving us wrong signals. Just in case you're still not convinced that it is fair to raise this question vis-a-vis -vis the economists, uh, I want to go back to the forefather of economics as a modern science, and that is Adam Smith. And this quotation uh, does indicate uh, that concern about welfare and well-being of the population at large is at the heart of economics. And in fact, there is a symbiotic relationship between growth, between growth and welfare or equity uh, in economics, which has a long tradition. You might think when, when we think back at Adam Smith, we always think about him as the father of the dismal science, and this is always juxtaposed to the rise of modern capitalism, uh, enlargement of private initiative, the invisible hand, and this aspect is overlooked. But I, I want to remind ourselves that concern with equity along with growth is at the heart of economics, and therefore that's another dimension why this question is relevant. Um, in the next 45 minutes, uh, what I want to uh, look at is a few preliminary remarks, after which I want to introduce a few uh, puzzles and anomalies in the MENA context, Middle East, North Africa region. And then I want to broaden the empirical discussion by looking at a range of, a wider range of economic, socio-economic socio indicators to see whether if we went beyond uh, narrow macro indicators, as was the case before the Arab uprising, we would be able to shed light and cast more insight on what happened after 2010. And then I would conclude by uh, offering my thoughts and revisiting the question. So, we might put this question at two levels. One is conceptually, since mainstream economics is essentially concerned with the study of rational behavior of homo economicus, which optimizes behavior based on equilibrium, maximization of objective function, and allows for change, only small changes at the margin, we might say, well, economics is actually ill-equipped to deal with big, uh, game-changing eruptions and changes of that type. So this is not an analytical framework, economics, mainstream economics, does not have the analytical framework to allow us to say something useful. Moreover, empirically also, there is a presumption that if you ask most people, when do you expect political upheaval to happen? At a time when the business cycle, economic cycle is on the way up, booming, jobs growing, economic growth taking place, prosperity, or on the downside, when we have recession, contraction, unemployment, immiserization. I venture to guess that most people would probably uh, uh, adhere to the latter. Hardship leads to discontent and frustration and hence to revolution. But that is a question actually I want to pause on. And, and in fact, at the back of the question uh, uh, that I'm posing tonight is in fact a bigger question. Are political uprisings and social implosions caused by and follow periods of economic hardship and austerity, or do they come after years of gro growth and prosperity? This is actually a question which is worth pondering on, because as I will uh, show in my uh, talk, the reality is actually complex, and I at least don't uh, adhere to a simple one-to-one -one relationship between economic and political cycles, that uprisings, and revolutions 
occur only after periods of downturn and contraction and recession. Uh, you could argue that during these times, people are actually struggling hard to survive. They don't have the luxury of thinking about liberties or going on a strike or, you know, withdrawing their labor. It's only when they're doing relatively, they're doing uh, better and are relatively better off that uh, these issues come to the fore. Now, with that background, let's look at the economic performance of the MENA region in the uh, decade before the uprising started. We are immediately struck by two uh, issues which present themselves as anomalies. Number one is, if you look at the growth record since 2000 till 2010, actually this period, the first decade of the new millennium, relatively speaking, the MENA region as a whole does quite well, especially compared with the decades before and especially with the 1980s and so on. I will go over this because this is true both in terms of uh, performance over time but also in relation to uh, comparison with other uh, regions. The second one is also that if we search for prevalence of deep uh, pre uh, pervasive poverty, again, evidence at least seems to suggest that, again, uh, MENA is not uh, one of those parts of the world which suffers from worst record of poverty. So, you know, if we were to look for low economic growth and poverty as explanatory variables behind the Arab uprisings, superficially at least circumstantial evidence judged by basic macro indicators, we don't find evidence of that. And of course this raises other questions. Perhaps economic factors were not uh, the main determinants of these uprisings. Perhaps. I think that question is a valid one to ask. And perhaps that relationship is not so straightforward and one-to-one -one as I suggested, or you could even go as far as questioning the validity, the quality of data. Perhaps this data is rubbish. We should always ask this. I mean, I'm sure there are a lot of students here, and you should never take uh, data at its face value, and it's always good to question the quality before jumping to conclusions. Let's quickly look at the record. I mean, if you look at the GDP, real GDP growth, uh, that is annual GDP growth in real terms. For the Arab world, you'll see that in the 10 years prior to the first uh, Arab uprising, growth rate was around 4.5% or so. Much better than 1980s and uh, 1990s even. Um, if you look at the MENA region again as a whole, that goes beyond the Arab world, uh, you're looking at fairly decent, respectable growth rates, definitely much higher than the world average in general. Of course, not as high as South Asia, but, uh, you know, this is, this is not exactly a decade where the fortunes, economic fortunes of MENA were contracting. If you look at, if you allow for population growth, if you look at GDP, real GDP per capita, however, the picture does change growth rates are almost half, indicating what we already know, uh, the Arab world uh, primarily, but most of MENA was experiencing rapid population growth rate, the so-called um, uh, Middle Eastern uh, demographic puzzle, that despite rising GDP per capita, population growth continued fast. And, and that, that erodes the picture to some extent, still above world averages. And uh, again, of course, not on par as South Asia. Now let's look at the specific uh, experience of the countries in the region. If you look at, for instance, Tunisia was where we witnessed the first uprising. Growth rate over that 10 year period is 4.5%. If you look at Egypt, it's almost 5%. If you look at Libya, not very different. And to the contrary, a country like Jordan, growing faster at 
was immune from uprising. The, the two countries with lowest growth rates, Algeria and Saudi Arabia, uh, below 4%, didn't experience the same rupture. So we can't really find a ready, simple, crude correspondence between economic performance uh, and the, the uprisings. Perhaps more interestingly, and this is the second puzzle, if you look at the evidence for poverty as defined on a headcount ratio, you can look at uh, extreme form of poverty, uh, the threshold being at $1.25 per person per day, or $2.275. These are measures that are used widely in international comparisons of uh, poverty uh, measurement is in uh, purchasing power parity, so we take into account how much one dollar can buy in different parts of the world. If you look at the Arab country, the, the, the light blue is the low threshold of poverty, 125. Only 4% of the population in the Arab world uh, is below that threshold line. Compared to South Asia, which is 40%, 10 times more. Africa, five times more. Half of the population is below $1.25. So if you were searching for poverty as a source of these uprisings against, again, that is not readily apparent. In the MENA context, in the Arab countries, the picture uh, does change when you take or adopt a different threshold, looking at $2 uh, per day per capita poverty uh, incidence goes up to almost 20%, but still nothing like the three quarters in South Asia or Africa. In fact, the figures for Arab countries are rather similar to a much more affluent region of the world like Latin America and the Caribbean. So, I mean, this is not to suggest that poverty doesn't exist at all, and everybody in MENA region is well off, but in comparative terms, this is not one of the poorest uh, regions of the world. Of course, if you change the threshold and go up to $2.75, then there is a difference, and 40% of the population in Arab countries fall below that. But, but still, compared to other areas, uh, the Arab countries uh, seem to have a comparatively better record. If you look at other, I won't bore you with too much statistics because you will have the PowerPoint uh, to look at. If you look at other indicators of inequality, Gini coefficient, for instance, which is used to measure inequality, you'll find, find for instance, th by the way, the picture here is very patchy. Data is uh, far from readily available or complete. But for instance, if you look at uh, a country like Tunisia, between 95 and 2000, uh, poverty seemed to be going down from 6.5% to 2.6%. The poverty defined by $1.25. And if you look at, for instance, the uh, ratio of, uh, if you look at Gini coefficient, it's quite stable. You know, in, in some countries, uh, it's even going down. If you look at, for instance, Morocco, these ones that I've highlighted is red color. Picture of inequality and poverty seems to be uh, on the way down, a downward trend. The one area where the Arab countries don't do so well, judged by standard uh, criteria, is in terms of job creation and employment. Now, typically, national unemployment rate in the MENA region uh, is double digit uh, and has been high for a long time. More importantly, uh, youth unemployment, youth here is defined as those between the age of 15 to 24. Sometimes it's 15 to 29, but uh, the ILO, International Labor Organization, figures reflected here look at 15 to 29 uh, age cohort. Youth unemployment in the MENA region is amongst the highest in the world, and it's much higher, sometimes as high as twice the national record. So this is, this is where, uh, you know, the MENA region in terms of standard uh, economic criteria doesn't come across as well as other parts of the world. 
And you can see, for instance, you know, even a country like Saudi Arabia has almost one third of its youth unemployed. These are, by the way, official data. It is quite plausible that official data actually underestimate the real unemployment uh, figures as well. I mean, no surprise in Iraq, these figures of 2010, almost half of the youth are unemployed. And, and, and you know, the West Bank and Gaza, 40%. The picture is quite depressing when it comes to youth. And within the youth category, also women tend to have higher unemployment rates, although female labor force participation in the MENA region is generally lower than many other developing countries. So <coughs> there is no doubt that there is a demographic dimension which characterizes the experience of economic growth uh, in the MENA region. And this is evident when we look at the composition of the population. If you look at the median age of the population, which splits the population into two equal halves, it's extraordinary, perhaps, that in a country like Yemen, 50% of the population are below the age of 17. And of course, this creates huge, enormous challenges. This youth bulge, the bottom of the population pyramid, after years, decades of rapid population growth, creates enormous pressures on the need for schools, for jobs, for housing, and so on and so forth. So I think this is something that, uh, and, and, and even in countries uh, like Tunisia, although it's not as low as 17, still it's a lot younger than, say, Europe. In Egypt, it's 24. In the West Bank and Gaza, it's uh, as low as 20. What this leads me to is this position of too much import attaching too much importance to standard uh, economic indicators in the sense that they don't often give us real insight and sometimes even can mislead us. Uh, what what uh, this leads me to is a desire to try and go beyond these uh, rather basic criteria. The question I want to ask is, if we were to look at whether the experience of growth in the Arab countries was inclusive or not, inclusive meaning benefiting a larger proportion of the population in the ways that I will explain in a moment. Does that give a different picture? Does that indicate a different picture? Now, inclusive growth is <coughs> a concept which is very much in vogue these days and is, has been popularized, especially after the Arab uprisings. And, uh, and uh, some people have uh, attributed the failure of economic performance in these countries to the type of growth which was quantitatively perhaps uh, significant but not inclusive enough in the sense that it didn't benefit large sections of the population but it, it benefited limited sections of the population. Now, le let's spend the next um, few minutes looking at how we can perhaps operationalize this concept of inclusive growth. Um, we can look at a long list of relevant indicators, uh, and there's no shortage of them, as we shall see in a moment. But what I want to do, because inclusive growth uh, is a composite con co concept, and the, the way to uh, summarize or capture composite concepts in economics is often done through uh, construction of what is known as the single composite index of which there are plenty of examples. I mean, the most famous one being the HDI, the Human Development Indicators. This was uh, conceptualized and defined in the early 1990s by, uh, by and, and every year now we have consistent data which is published by UNCTAD. Uh, they're widely known as HDI, and IHDI is inequality adjusted. They're similar, uh, and it has three components. It has GDP, but also education and health. So it goes beyond a simple concern with GDP figures. We have several indicators uh, looking at different aspects of environment. The most important one perhaps being EPI, the uh, environment, Environmental Performance Index. Uh, 
in gender area, we have gender inequality index and global gender gap index. Just to mention two, there's, this is now an industry. I mean, in wealth, in water, there is even a social progress index which, has, which is constructed on the basis of several more detailed indicators. Now, inspired by that methodology, I want to see if we can construct a social, uh, a, a, an inclusive growth index which can then be used to shed light perhaps more thoroughly and more deeply on the experience of the type of economic growth that took place in the decade before the Arab uprising. Now my starting point is what would be the main pillars or main components, main dimensions of inclusive growth, growth that benefits the larger part of the population and one which is um, sustainable. Obviously, I would want to see key economic data included. I want some political indicators included. I want social indicators and also spatial. So factor in rising uh, geographical inequality. And of course, the sustainability dimension is captured by environment. Now on that basis, we can draw up, and I'm not going to bore you with all these. This is a table which where I've listed some 30 more detailed indicators pertaining to each one of these dimensions. For instance, you can see growth can be measured by GDP per capita, the level, and also growth rates or GDP per capita growth rate, which we looked at already. You can look at labor force and employment, various indicators there, health and demographics, for instance, life expectancy, infant mortality, public health expenditure as an indicator of access to education, uh, access to um, uh, health, and so on and so forth. For instance, safety nets, uh, pensions, uh, welfare and social security, income distribution, and poverty headcounts, which I've already mentioned, and so on. Now, the problem is it's easy enough to construct these uh, indicate these, these uh, indices and the difficulty and the main challenge is availability of data. For some of these data would be very difficult to find. So what I've done is based on a smaller number of indicators, as we shall see in a moment, only 14, but focusing on key dimensions of what I consider to be relevant to understanding the nature of economic performance, uh, I proceed with those indicators, first of all, the first step is how to, to uh, select these. And selection by definition is partly subjective and partly dictated by data availability. This is something that we cannot escape, as we shall see in a moment. Then complete data sets will also be uh, rare. For some standard indicators, for instance, GDP growth rate, we have, you know, this is very easy to get hold of even life expectancy, infant mortality, some, some, some standard uh, indicators for, for them we have pretty full data set. But there are data sets, as we shall see in a second, where we would uh, find gaps and missing values and they do uh, affect the picture. Even if we had reliable, useful, complete, or comprehensive data sets, Still the question arises as to what do we do with them in terms of aggregation? How do we go about aggregating them in order to find a composite index? And of course the last stage is uh, exploration. Now, by way of an exercise, what I've done is I've looked at these broad categories, growth, health and demographics, labor force and employment, education, gender, environment, inequality, poverty, governance, political factors, and for each one of them, I've tried to select a key, one or two or three in some cases, key indicators for which data is available. And world development indicators, which are published by the World Bank, offer consistent uh, time series data for most of these indicators. But uh, for some of them, I've also used, for instance, for gender, I've used a composite index, which is 
available from the gender inequality index. Rather than to reinvent the wheel and construct a gender index myself, I've used what is already available. This is already multi-dimensional single index, and it's widely used. Likewise with environment, this, is, this EPI is produced by Yale University, and it has been established as a credible indicator of environmental performance. It utilizes a wide range of, I think it's about 24 indicators itself, so I'm just utilizing the index uh, here. For governance, uh, there are one or two political indices that are widely used. I've used Corruption Perception Index, CPI. Data is available, in this case, for 144 countries. Uh, I've looked at two shorter periods. My main interest is to look at the decade before the first Arab uprising. So it's the first 10 years of the millennium, as I mentioned earlier. But I've broken that down into two five-yearly periods. Because if you look at a single year, there's bound to be a lot of fluctuation. So I'm looking at moving average for five years. The first period is 2001 to 2005, and the next one is 2006 to 2010. Um, the full data set, as from, for instance, the World Bank World Development Indicators, includes something like 200, more than 210 countries. But some of these are small islands, territories, and for which also data is not fully available. I've pruned the list down to include 153 countries in, in, in this data set. So, for instance, I mean, obvious cases for North Korea, you won't have data for most, even the basic indicators. So you don't include that. And, and as I said, a lot of other smaller territories and islands, especially in the Pacific and so on. So 153 countries uh, included. But even so, there is variation as to the extent of data availability. For instance, you can see here for Gini index, measure of income inequality, the number of countries for which data is available drops to below 100. So this goes back to the point about missing values, with which we have to live. I mean, we can't. We can't uh, do anything about that. Um, now, basically, I've aggregated here. It may seem complicated, but I have 14 indicators, remember? I have 153 countries, so it's a matrix. I have taken an aggregated arithmetic mean, an average. The question, as with any averaging method arises as to what weights would you, what weight should I attach to life expectancy, what weight should I attach to uh, governance indicator. Now, the short answer is there is no one universally agreed set of weights. I've, on one hand, applied equal weights to all of them, one fourteenth. Each one of my indicators has the same weight. But I've also, as an exercise, played with variations in indices. And the picture doesn't change that much. And I'm not too fussed about the exact uh, weights. And what I've reported here and for the rest of the discussion carries equal weights. But th this is not to say that somebody else cannot apply their own weights. There are some other statistical techniques, for instance, uh, principal component analysis, where you can derive scientific weights, but that requires complete full data sets. It cannot allow for missing data. And if I go down that route, then the choice of 153 countries would dramatically be reduced to maybe 30, 40 countries only for which there is complete data set without any missing values. And not only that, most of the MENA countries will disappear from the picture. So that was not an option. And as I said, I'm really not too worried about the weights, just bearing in mind that I've applied equal weights to each one of these indicators. So 153 countries maximum and 14 indicators. Now, here we have the results of this calculation. Remember that we started with uh, dimensions such as growth, labor markets, and demographics, education, gender, um, environment, governance, inequality, and poverty. So it's fairly representative. But always bearing in mind that at the end of the day, we are limited by and 
dictated to by what data is available. Of course, as and when better, more data becomes available, this can be easily adapted to take account of that. Now, in this table, and, and by the way, I've used ranks. So if you have 153 countries, say you're looking at um, gender inequality or infant mortality, the countries can be ranked from 1 to 153. The country at the bottom, the, wor the one with the worst performance, would be ranked 153. The one at the top is number one. So the, 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 the scores are average rankings. So I'm looking at relative performance. It's not an absolute performance. So if all countries are doing better, in order for one country to stand out, they have to do even better. And if all countries are not doing better, for instance, which is possible over the business cycle, then again, it's the relative uh, performance. And, and ranks would be from, R would be from 1 to 153. But there's a second issue. Because the number of countries that are included in the data set are not always equal, for instance, for growth, you have 153 countries. So ranks could be anything from 1 to 153. But for structure of employment, there are only 99 countries included. Ranks could be only between 1 and 99. You don't have figures above 99. So this raises the need for standardization. So if I said, for instance, a country like Bulgaria ranked fifth in terms of infant mortality, your first question would be immediately, out of how many? Out of six or out of 153? In order to take uh, that into account, I standardize on a linear scale between 0 and 100, which is very simple. This is very, very simple. Uh, so the scores we have here, the average, for instance, for Algeria between 2001 and 2005, average during those five years, is 40. Minimum is 0. Maximum is 100. So you can see these North African countries, at least these first four, Algeria, Egypt, Libya, and Morocco, are in the bottom half. They're not doing great, okay? Actually, ironically, Tunisia is, shows a better performance. This is taking into account a wider set of socioeconomic indicators. So that's one thing. You can look to see how these countries are doing compared to each other. Smaller Gulf states, Bahrain, Kuwait, uh, Qatar, these, the score for these are uh, in the 60s, more than 60s, is quite high compared to those. And, and likewise, UAE. UAE, Qatar, and Bahrain are quite high. Saudi Arabia, again, is on par with uh, the other North African countries. But total number of countries, worth bearing in mind, is 153. Now, what is also interesting is looking at the trend. If you go from the first five-year period to the next five-year period, you can see Maybe this is, uh, the color is not very uh, self-evident, but I've highlighted this in red. The negative figures, Algeria has suffered 14% change in its inclusive growth index, okay? Bahrain and Kuwait, likewise. Qatar, a very modest drop. Now, the Arab countries, for instance, like Tunisia, which suffered from, which had the uprising, pretty stable of modestly improving. Egypt, the same. So in this context, at least, looking at a wider set of socioeconomic indicators, again, we don't seem to be able to find uh, an easy to explain a relationship between economic performance and political stress, which was the original question. Now, let's look at some more Middle Eastern countries. Um, the country with the highest uh, inclusive growth index here, Israel. This is comparable to the uh, smaller oil-rich Gulf states, Bahrain, Kuwait, uh, UAE, okay? Now, I Iran is very similar to the other groupings. You will, I'm sure, quickly notice how low Iraq's inclusive growth index was in the first five years. Surprise, surprise, this is the year of, you know, this covers the period of invasion, the destruction. 
So that's no big surprise. But what's interesting is you can see the biggest improvement, almost 100% doubling, is also in the case of Iraq, but that concealed a very low base in the second five years afterwards. Um, Turkey, very similar to Iran and others, uh, and, and Yemen, a poor uh, country of the region, suffering significantly in terms of its inclusive growth index, almost by one third, almost. And the other ones that also indicate uh, a deterioration are Iran, uh, Syria, and Yemen. What is very interesting here is it seems that economic stress is actually indicated by the oil states, not so the countries which were rich. And remember that those 10 years, 2000, at least seven or eight of those 10 years, 2002 to 2008, international oil prices were on the way up. It was almost a one-way street. Of course, there was fluctuation, but the trend line was very significantly up. This, this is one of those interesting puzzles. Those people who argued that uh, the mo main motivation for the U.S. to intervene in Iraq was securing affordable, secure, uh, stable supplies of oil should uh, remember that, in fact, when the U.S. In, uh, interfered in Iraq in 2003, oil prices were around 25. By 2008, July, oil prices were at historically high, $147. And U.S. is the biggest importer, or was the biggest oil importer. So that intervention was to secure affordable, stable supplies of oil. It m miserably failed in that respect. Uh, but I'm sure some of you here are uh, familiar with the, the so-called resource curse argument, something which uh, Mohammed has worked on. This seems to shed some new light on it. Actually, the poorer, the resource poor countries of the MENA do not seem to show a deterioration uh, in their inclusive growth index, but it looks, for instance, if you remember, uh, here, Algeria is an oil state. Algeria is an oil state. Iran is an oil state. Bahrain is. Kuwait is. Not all of them, but there seems to be some, some consistency in that. Let's look at some so-called BRICS. I mean, China is in the upper 50%, above median. So is Chile, and China shows an improvement. But not so with India. India is low and remains low. Perhaps a puzzle which I am not too sure about is Malaysia. Malaysia drops by almost 17%. We, I need to talk to an expert on Malaysia, what, what happened in this period. And South Africa as well. I mean, this is a rich database. There are 153 countries. I've only extracted a selection, a sample, just to reflect on. My main interest is on the uh, Middle Eastern countries. There's plenty of other interesting stuff there that one needs to be examined if one agrees with the choice of the indicators. And I did say that you know these indicators can, of course, be readily changed. Something which is very interesting is uh, it wasn't reflected in the tables that I show you. If you lo actually look at the top five, these are typically Singapore, Scandinavian countries, uh, sometimes New Zealand. It's very predictable. It almost doesn't matter what indicator you look at. And it also doesn't seem to matter when you aggregate these indicators, looking at different dimensions, different uh, criteria. Again, the top five seems to be pretty stable. You typically find Denmark, Norway, uh, Sweden, as I said, Singapore. There's something you know, about the performance which seems to indicate consistency. And sadly, if you also look at the bottom 10 or 20, it's usually uh, poor countries in Africa. What is less uh, possible to forecast uh, is the middle 80%. There's a lot of uncertainty there. 
Now, naturally, <coughs> one also wants to find out what is the relative importance of each one of these indicators. For instance, is GDP per capita growth important, as important as infant mortality and so on? In order to address that, I've done a, a sensitivity analysis whereby at each stage I relax or take out one of the indicators to see what impact it has on the inclusive growth index. If it pushes up, if the exclusion of that indicator pushes up the inclusive growth index estimation, its inclusion must have pulled it down, and vice versa. Now, what is very interesting is that the picture that emerges here, again, I'm not sure if you can see, but it's to do with uh, employment. This is uh, employment population for all population above 15, and then employment population of youth, 15 to 24. It seems, for instance, in this country, Algeria, the, exclusion, it, the, the inclusive growth index is sensitive to the inclusion of the employment data, employment on employment. Remember a while back I said despite impressive growth rates, despite an apparent absence of prevalent poverty on par with other parts of the world, it's the Achilles, uh, Achilles heel is uh, the job market and the youth bulge. And this also shows here uh, in the case of uh, the first five-year period and the same in the second five-year period again in countries like Algeria and, and in Egypt as well and in Morocco as well, Tunisia as well. So at least amongst these 14 indicators, um, generally social indicators and growth across MENA has been uh, favorable. But the age structure is skewed. There is a big youth bulge, and uh, this poses serious uh, challenges for creation of jobs, not only in the years and decades leading to the uprisings, but perhaps even more importantly after the post-uprising period. And this is a challenge that will remain. I want to take the next few minutes to sort of critically examine the value of an exercise like this. First of all, <coughs> as I said, this inclusive growth index is based on a relative concept of rankings. So it's not indicating to us in how much in absolute terms a country is uh, improving its position. It's relative to others, whether its ranking has gone up or down. So we have to keep that in mind. Um, and it's not free from shortcomings. Um, for instance, it may, when we look at the gross uh, indicator, we may just miss out on some of the detail. And as you know, uh, detail, the, the, the devil could be in the detail. We shouldn't lose sight of specific indicators, even if the overall or aggregate inclusive growth in index indicates a positive picture. The problem with the choice of indicators I've already mentioned, the problem of weights I've already mentioned, and of course data availability is always a challenge, um, and we should also ask whether this is actually telling us something new uh, over and above what we already know. Some problems with these composite indicators are uh, structural. It's not just inclusive growth index, but generally when you construct <coughs> a composite index, this is, this is something that has been described as the tyranny of international rankings. Some of these rankings capture attention. They produce perfect material for propaganda. If you do well, it's a little bit like university league tables. I don't know if you have them in Germany or not. If you don't, they're probably coming this way. <laughs> They'll be imported soon. We have university rankings, we have schools rankings. Whenever somebody does well, then you can be sure that this will be flashing on the screens. We've gone up so many, you know. And, and that can be also reflected here. Countries that do well in international rankings seem to uh, overstate the importance of that. And of course, these rankings can be unstable and change from one year <coughs> to a, another. <coughs> 
Last but not least, <coughs> we have to remember that when we throw a lot of economic indicators in the pot, shake the pot, and come up with a single number, this is essentially what uh, some people have described as a mashed up index. It may be useful in terms of giving us some insight into a complex, multifaceted uh, issue, but we may also lose perspective of the importance of specific aspects. For instance, uh, a very useful analogy that has been made, if, for instance, you're trying to buy a second-hand car, if the salesperson tells you that they've uh, uh, done a very detailed, uh, elaborate analysis and constructed uh, an index for cars which take into account various aspects, and a particular car you're interested in has come up top, would that be persuasive, or at the end of the day, still you would want to look at some critical criteria? You know, the uh, fuel level, uh, the battery level, uh, you know, the brakes, and so on and so forth. No composite indicator would be as uh, useful or impressive as concerned with specific criteria. And, and, and in that respect also, I think we shouldn't lose picture. Okay, let me now conclude. What we've done is we started with a question, which is, could we have forecast, forecasted the Arab uprisings? Well, the answer was, if we expected an easy one-to-one -one relationship between economic performance and uprisings, political discontent, social eruption, that picture, if anything, was completely the opposite. What if we looked at a more comprehensive, uh, a more a fuller set of criteria and data? And that itself leads me to uh, argue that even looking at a more comprehensive set of data, it doesn't seem as if the relationship between the economic cycle, economic performance, and political cycle is so straightforward. So perhaps we need to re-examine the nature of the relationship, the perceived relationship between politics and economics. And for the last slide, I want us to sort of look back at history. If you look at the French Revolution, and there is a lot of debate among sociologists. Did French Revolution, one of the most, admittedly one of the most important revolutions in history, did it take place during times of economic decline and contraction and recession, immiserization, or during time of economic boom and prosperity? And this has led to uh, Davis to put forward the idea of a J curve, whereby he argues and he, are, he goes beyond the French Revolution, and he studied a uh, number of, this is a study in the 1970s, but he looks at a number of revolutions, the most important one of which is the French one. And he argues basically revolutions occur not at the time of economic decline, not at the time of economic uh, ascent, but when you have a period of growth and prosperity followed by a sharp deceleration. That is when the gap between expectations and actual outcome creates frustrations and pressures. And apparently this is what happened with the French Revolution. Hence the idea of J, it's an inverse J curve. And um, looking back at examples from the Middle East region, uh, actually Iranian Revolution of 1979 also 79 uh, was <coughs> a few years after the first major oil uh, boom for the Middle East. I know oil shock for the consuming nations, but uh, the first oil uh, 
uh, quadrupling oil prices in 1973-1974, and 1970s for oil producers is known as the golden decade. So the 1979 revolution in Iran didn't come at a time when the economy was you know, on the downside, if anything, quite the opposite. But what's very interesting is after a few years of intense acceleration of growth, which created its own types of stress, there was a deceleration around 1976 or so. And, and that seems to have uh, given rise to uh, frustrations and dissatisfactions. Now, I'd like to leave you with a thought about the Arab uprisings. If you look at the period, uh, the years before the Arab uprisings, uh, it's true that not all Arab economies are beneficiaries of high oil prices, but many are, and there's also a trickle-down effect in the sense that, you know, through migration, through migrant remittances and so on, uh, other countries also benefit, especially the labor uh, exporting countries. And uh, again, I don't think that, you know, in the period leading up to 2010 can be characterized as anything but uh, weak international oil weak oil, oil, oil markets, quite the opposite. So although the global financial crisis in 2008 took a little while to make an impact on the region, it is quite possible that, you know, toward 2009, uh, 2010, that uh, wedge that was being created between the expectations and the actual economic performance might have fanned frustration and helped uh, uh, with the <coughs> eruptions. Um, so let me stop there, and I'm sure uh, you have some questions which I'd be very happy to answer. Thank you.